Irana, bonjour. Welcome to another episode of the Pacific Way. The Central and Western Pacific Ocean is home to the world's largest tuna stocks. But for the three largest tuna exporters in that region, Fiji, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, translating that to improved product quality, market accessibility and greater economic returns has been a major concern. The Pacific community, together with the European Union, joined forces to help the three countries address that. The vast blue Pacific Ocean covers about 46% of the Earth's water surface, making it the largest oceanic division in the world. This massive stretch is also home to island states who rate some of the world's most economically poor and vulnerable to climate change. However, as if to balance the inequality, below the western and central Pacific Ocean is the world's largest tuna stocks. Once considered a low-value substitute for other fish like salmon and sardines, world tuna catches have increased rapidly ever since canned tuna took off in the 1970s and has now become a billion-dollar industry worldwide. Economic gains from tuna catches remain largely disproportionate for Western and Central Pacific Island countries in their own 200-mile exclusive economic zone. Whilst annually these countries may gain $200 million worth of tuna catches, foreign fishing vessels in the same waters gain billions, while millions are lost to illegal fishing boats. The Pacific Community, SPC, in collaboration with the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, FFA, implemented the development of tuna fisheries in the Pacific ACP countries, or DevFish project, which is funded by the European Union. The project aimed not only to rectify the imbalance through tuna fisheries development, but also control illegal fishing. The trend already in the last four or five years that the uh, soap-based processing sector of the tuna industry has grown. There's more factories now starting to be established and set up in PNG, uh, Solomons, uh, Marshall Island, uh, Fiji has some number of them. Uh, so basically, the processing sector now uh, of uh, the tuna, traditionally which used to be exported to outside of the region and processed, are moving to the region to be based near where the raw, raw resource is. So in that sense, when you are trying to domesticate and uh, develop the industry, um, some of the gaps are human resource capabilities. In November 2015, the DevFish project organized a capacity building workshop in Fiji's tuna canning capital Levuka for cannery operators and competent authority officers from Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands and Fiji. The three countries are also the largest tuna loin and canned tuna exporters in the Pacific. It's the first day and Lomai Viti Provincial Administrator, Mr. Limi Rokonduru, officially opens the workshop. But I welcome you all to this training uh, this morning. I also thank uh, SPC for selecting Lemuka to be our center for training for these two weeks. Eh? I think uh, for all of us here in Lemuka, all know that uh, the fishing sector, namely here, uh, is the backbone of uh, like the rural economy here in Lemuka. But I know that the training that we will undertake in these two weeks will be able to share ideas and experiences of best practices, practice, uh, practice on uh, your various uh, areas of operation. So mostly we'll be talking all along with fish and operations in the fish canning operation. Eh? The thermal processing and auditing workshop is conducted by Timothy Numenilangi, the only Pacific Islander who is a qualified thermal processing specialist. After I graduated from uni, I was uh, working in the fish canning industry. Even back at school, you know, I was interested in how canning operation was done. And that's when drive me to get myself, get employed in a fish canning operation. And after that, uh, PNG, 
Fisheries Authority, they were looking for inspectors, and that's when I was one of those five to join the team. Then I was working there for like 10 years. After that, I was involved more or less in the inspection of fish scanning operation in PNG. And then I do also help provide technical assistance back to the companies in terms of uh, setting up their canning operation. And that's when I got myself trained in uh, thermal processing. I went to New Zealand, in, to Australia, Thailand, USA, and Canada. I did my final training for the certification for Thermal Process Authority. So after that, uh, I decided that maybe I should go regional. So that's when I joined SPC. Thermal processing is an important step in the tuna canning production process. And training in this particular area for the 20 workshop participants is critical to their line of work. So currently now it's like on-site is capacity building for production workers and the quality assurance. Because these are the guys that should making sure that the product is safe before it gets out on the market. So very importantly, it's a public health concern. We want to produce a product that is safe for human consumption. So that is why I see the technical areas in terms of canning becomes a great area where most of the operators, they still need to fulfill those requirements. Following the formalities on the first day, workshop participants are asked to introduce themselves and elaborate on their personal expectations from the training. We produce both mackerel and tuna. So I work with the quality assurance department. As a supervisor, I look after the incoming raw materials. So my job requires me to just inspect the fish that come in, the packaging, the cans that we use, we do thermal processing because we want to make sure the product is sterile and safe for human consumption. So that's like basics of it. But this training, they're talking about the technical aspects of it. So I hope that at the end of it, I'll not only know the food safety side of it, but the technical side of it as well. Our product is uh, fish and we work on uh, pressure and temperatures. So instruments that are calibrated uh, for presses like uh, pressure gauges, pressure indicators, and pressure controllers. And on temperature, I have temperature indicators, temperature controllers. They are critical. For example, in retort, if we have a deviation, the temperature drops uh, below one degree or increase uh, uh, beyond one degree Celsius of the process temperature, we can have uh, under process if it goes below or over process if it goes up and it will affect the product that we export on the market. I'm expected to go home and share what I learned here to my colleagues at home and also in, good, in making good decision making in uh, thermal processing. And as an instrument technician, I can work together with supervisors there to get a process within a, what's that, QA expectation. We are the competent authority yeah, looking after fish and fishery products for EU markets. And uh, yes, that's what we do. We do auditing and uh, inspections of uh, land-based facilities plus uh, fishing vessels yeah, in uh, Fiji, local and uh, foreign vessels. Okay, my expectations is to improve or enhance my knowledge on uh, thermal processing, especially on uh, my competency level. Yeah? technical uh, competency on uh, thermal processing and uh, also hopes to learn from uh, my colleagues eh, from the Pacific. He's from uh, Salmon and PNG. Eh? So what I'm doing here is like training the trainers. Most of these people, they have a lot of experience back in their companies, but they lack this technical know-how knowledge. So what I'm doing is I'm building up, bridging up that small gap. I've seen that they are learning a lot. They're asking a lot of questions. And that's through the questions they are asking, I can pick up what are the areas that they still need to understand. So then we spend a lot of time discussing those things. So discussing in terms of the you know, practical wise, how they should do it, what does the law say, okay, basically to protect public health. So I see they're starting to pick up a lot of things now. Le 
Mecca is a picturesque port town rich in history. The former colonial capital still has visible remnants of the past. The deed of session site where chiefs ceded Fiji to Britain is a reminder that this is where Fiji began its first steps of nationhood. This Morris Headstrom building from the 1800s is one of the town's oldest historical landmarks and quite fittingly now houses the town museum. This is the original Bank of New South Wales, while Fiji's first hotel is still in operation. The first public school was opened here, the first town hall, the first township. There are a lot of firsts in Levuka. So it's a place where people could come and see where Fiji started. Like they say, uh, Levuka is a place uh, where Fiji began. With a population of about 8,000, in 2013, Levuka was officially listed as a World Heritage Site, thanks to a submission made by Fiji's Heritage Department to the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. So I believe there are around five or six uh, general criteria, but Levuka was nominated under two. One is, uh, the most important one is the interchange in cultural values. Eh? Uh, Levuka had to go through a lot of stages. Eh? First, we had the indigenous community. And if you, if you see Levuka, uh, the town in itself was inhabited by indigenous communities. And this was um, uh, uh, authenticized through archaeological digs that was done by the Fiji Museum and, of course, uh, international experts who had come, come through. Eh? And these are critical because it shows the, the change in time. Eh? From that time and then the coming of the Europeans when they settled and uh, the, the enormous uh, contribution and the work and, of course, the friendliness of the Turanga Tuilevuka in accepting uh, beachcombers eh? and uh, others, uh, visitors who came on board and began to occupy Levuka town. Eh? Normally, through time, the changing uh, you know, population, eh? diaspora, movement of people, uh, often changes eh? the whole uh, uh, facade and the, the, the physical nature of the, the whole place. Eh? But for Levuka, through the intercultural values and the changes, people coming in, population coming in, it did not uh, change the, the building style. That maintained, and that is the second criteria. The architectural facade and the whole, uh, this whole uh, uh, building and the settings in Levuka was able to be maintained. Levuka's geographical size limited the expansion of the colonial settlement there, and because of that, in 1877, the capital was moved to Suva. With the new capital now the hub for commercial activity, Levuka's main industry, Copra, also dwindled. Fortunately, the town became a tuna trading port in the 1950s. At the time, we had a person who was running the pineapple factory here. His name was Mr. McGowan. And he uh, and others got together and Mr. McGowan took the initiative of going to Japan and talking to some business people there to see if they could uh, have a central uh, a freezing plant for the tuna that was being caught in the Pacific. Because to take tuna all the way to Japan would be impractical at the time and Fiji being the hub in the Pacific was ideal so with that I think that's how CETO came in. The original Japanese CETO company developed into the Pacific Fishing Company or PAFCO when the Fiji government acquired majority shares in 1987. Okay our main operations is we do loaning for Bumblebee Foods of USA. Loining means we convert the albaco into uh, processed loins, which is then ready to go into the cans. There's, there's an operation we do on behalf of uh, Bumblebee Foods of US, who supply the fish to the factory. The, the, the fish is only albaco tuna. We process, convert it into loins, and then the loins is taken by Bumblebee to their plant in, in US. That's our main operation. Other than that, we have uh, 
caning operations. We have the Sunbell brand in the market. We produce about 300,000 cases of cane tuna every year. The company is the largest employer on the island, with 70% of women and 30% of men comprising its current workforce. We employ 1,000 people, or more than 1,000 people when we run uh, full shifts, when we run two shifts. This is direct employment. And then we have indirect employment who are other service providers, area operators, there are restaurants, others who provide service. So my, uh, my belief is we employ directly and indirectly, we employ about 60% of the population. PAFCO has been instrumental in propping up the local Lebuka economy, contributing about six to eight million dollars in wages annually and pays out about two million dollars in local transportation services for its night shift workers. <laughs> This industry is really important to, especially in terms of development. Uh, one of the aim of rural development is to improve the livelihood of our rural community. And I believe uh, PAFCO itself is supporting this uh, commitment and also in assisting our villages to be self-reliant on themselves. I understand uh, the fishing industry is also contributing to that a lot in uh, Lomavite. The economic spin-offs is quite evident with the businesses in town. Some of the older shops are still in operation because of the vibrant nature of the economy. Uh, at the moment, uh, with the tuna catches quite high and more supplies coming in, uh, the fishing company is uh, operating in two shifts. So when it's operating on two shifts, there's a lot more movement uh, in town. The taxi business is uh, doing well, the restaurants are doing well, the businesses are doing well. So it's sort of uh, coming down the line. Uh, everybody seems to be doing as well as there's a lot of more, more people traveling in and out. So overall it's been good not only for the local economy but for the national economy as well. But in 2013, the community at Lebuka felt vulnerable once again when there was talk of relocating the PAFCO operations to Suva. PAFCO is the backbone of Lebuka. If PAFCO is not here, Lebuka is not here. PAFCO has uh, done a lot for the people of Lebuka in the sense of um, employment. And people from uh, other islands, even from Suva, they're all coming to Lebuka to work. Uh, I think a lot of people here sort of uh, weren't, well, they didn't like the idea. Because basically what the government is trying to do is to decentralize the economy, not have everything happening just between the Suva and Osori corridor or in that area. So the thought of, you know, shifting the uh, the factory to Suva, I don't think it's, it was a good move. Uh, but fortunately, that didn't come about. Uh, the decision was made that the, <laughs> I mean, PEFCO is the main state of Lebuka, and if the facility is moved, there'll be no, no economic activity in Lebuka. And so the decision was then made that PEFCO should remain in Lebuka. At the training, workshop participants are preparing to tour the PAFCO premises for their practical lessons in thermal processing. Theory plus a hands-on practical approach ensures that these participants grasp the fundamentals of this important process. Here, they are taken through the production stages of canning tuna. 
Like canning operation, the most two critical area is canning, it's seaming of the cans. That is like once you pack your product into the can, you put the lid on and then seal it off. So you have to seal that can in order for it must not have any holes or micro pores inside. The tuna cans are loaded onto trays and carted into this chamber-like cooker called the retort, where it is cooked. And basically in the retorting, also is a very critical area. In operation of the machine, you have to do it correctly and apply the correct cooking time and temperature. Because the important thing is we are trying to destroy the Clostridium botulinum spores. Okay? Clostridium botulinum is a bacteria that produces toxins. Okay? It's called botulinum toxins. And that toxins, even in a very small amount, presents in the can. And if you eat, it will paralyze the nervous system. Okay? So when it paralyzes the nervous system, you will not be able to you know, roll your tongue, uh, roll your eyebrows, you will have uh, breathing difficulty, you have high blood pressure, and all this will eventually lead to death. So that is why we have very strong laws, regulations, acts, and standards are put in place to govern the operations of canning. Okay? So that is why all the canning operators, they must comply with these laws. Solomons and PNG tuna canneries export to mainly the European Union market, while Fiji largely exports to the United States. This training also touched on export compliance issues with the European Union market. European Union also, their auditors, the food and veterinary officers, they also come on site for inspection. Okay. I think on this part of the world, to Fiji, PNG and Solomon, they came in uh, 2008 and 2009. They did inspections, and that's when they found out that Fiji was failing to meet that standard. They list, they list Fiji, and PNG was put on a red list until they're making sure that all the compliance levels were done correctly, then the products were getting into the market. So Fiji, we did a lot of work in uh, 2009, 2010 to get them back for Fiji to export products into the EU market. And in PNG, there was only one company that was suspended for nine months for them to fix all the non-compliance before they can have access to EU. And EU is a very stringent market, but importantly, they provide also a lot of assistance back to Asia in the Pacific Island countries. Following the two weeks of intense learning, workshop participants set an exam to determine whether they qualify for accreditation. After this training, they will be qualified and they will be certified in order to inspect a fish canning operation. All the monitoring in the plant, all the critical parameters that the factory must meet in order to make that food safe, they will be qualified to do that. Because the regulation, it clearly says that anyone inspecting a canning operation must be trained and competent. So that is why we run this thermal process workshop to build the capacity for them in order to inspect and making sure that the product they process in a fish canning operation is safe for consumption. And also on the records, the persons who are trained in thermal processing, they can only sign off on all the thermal process records. Following the training, most of the employees felt better equipped to tackle industry requirements. I think the, the most important thing is uh, uh, how we do inspections on retorting. Yeah. You need to look at the critical factors, the critical factors that, uh, that the company needs to follow to ensure that the products are commercially sterile. So we need to capture that in our checklist. So I think the most important thing here is to build on from the checklist that we have, put some more, put some more questions into the checklist so we can capture those critical factors. It is good to know that the industry are committed and they know the market access requirements, especially on uh, EU requirements uh, that will make our work easier when we come and audit eh? They know what we are looking for and uh, that is very important for us. The about processing of um, audit, it's very important because back in my company, it's one area that I left as a trainee. So, Acquiring this training is very important for me. So when I go back to my company, I will be able to understand where 
we are supposed to implement our audit. Through capacity building, the EU DevFish project has been able to respond to industry and government needs in upskilling both cannery production workers and competent authority personnel on key technical production processes and major market access requirements. And it's trainings like these that not only contribute to improved shore-based production processes, product quality, better access to EU markets and opportunities for career development, but more importantly, as their slogan suggests, to help regain a fairer slice for the Pacific. You can look forward to another exciting episode of the Pacific Way next week. For more of our videos and stories, check out our Pacific Community YouTube channel and the Pacific Way Facebook page. Until next week, tofa soifua, mahalo and metaki.